Welcome to the class of uh, Advanced Life Insurance uh, Mathematics. And our goal for this afternoon is that we're going to work through some um, computer coding um, demonstrations of uh, calibrating the Lee Carter model and setting up a uh, mortality forecasting uh, model using this uh, calibrated uh, Lee Carter parameters. And we're going to do that with R, um, obviously. Right. So let's get started uh, here. So first of all, where can you find our um, code? Well, as in the previous uh, computer lab, I put everything online on my uh, GitHub site where you will find the repository on mortality dynamics. And there you can find uh, the lecture sheets, the code, the data sets, and everything uh, you need for this uh, computer lab, right? So I'm gonna show it, um, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to show you where this GitHub repository can be found, but that's the, that's the go-to um, site. Okay, so here you find again uh, the tutorial um, together, so we already discussed that um, earlier on. So this is work by myself, together with uh, Bavo, who is my PhD student, and in the past, uh, Sander de Vrind, who is now with the National Bank in Belgium, also contributed to, this, um, to these examples. Right, so we're gonna work with R, we're gonna need R Studio, and we're gonna load a few packages that we need throughout the tutorial, okay? So let's see what we're gonna, what we're gonna do today. So how is the code uh, organized? With, which uh, sec sections can you find in this, um, in this demo? So the whole idea is that we're gonna focus on fitting the Lee Carter model. Yeah, so I pick one particular uh, stochastic mortality model. And if you understand how this works, then you will also be able to uh, make the step from Lee Carter to Lily uh, to the kearns blake Dowd model, uh, etc. Because um, it's just about showing you the, the main steps in the coding. And then you can also apply these to other uh, stochastic mortality models, right? So we're going to focus on the Lee Carter and we're going to focus on uh, forecasting the um, the kappa, so the fitted period effects with a random walk with drift, right? And that's what I'm going to demonstrate with the coding. So there are essentially uh, four parts that we need to work through. First of all, where do we get our data? Uh, so that's quite similar to what we did um, last week. So where to find our data, how to import um, useful mortality uh, statistics. And then we're going to focus on two possible ways to uh, fit the Lee Carter. First, I'm going to do that with the least squares um, solution, uh, where I will minimize a sum, an, an objective function that is essentially a sum of square differences between what I try to model and what my model proposes as a functional expression for this uh, target, right? And then we're going to do the same uh, Lee Carter model. We're, we're going to switch to the Poisson likelihood. And then the last step of the tutorial, we're going to focus on calibrating the random walk with drift, uh, generating um, paths for the future, et cetera, et cetera. So that's everything that has to do with uh, forecasting. OK? So whenever you have a question, do not hesitate to, to interrupt and to, to address this question. So here we go. Let's see uh, where, what kind of data I'm going to use in, in, in the workshop and how to, uh, where to find uh, this data, right? So first of all, in the uh, first part of the, of the demonstration, what I did was I uh, pre-downloaded the life table for males in Belgium, as it is currently available on the human mortality uh, database. So if you go to the human mortality database, and if you look there, uh, for the country Belgium, and if you pick the, the life table in a one-by-one one format, so that means one age and uh, one year per record, then uh, you will see, then you will get the, the, the life table that uh, we're going to work with, okay? So this life table, I preloaded it, uh, pre-downloaded it, saved it as a TXT file, and I'm going to load this uh, data set into R. And the way how I'm going to do that is perhaps a little bit different from uh, what we've done in the past. I'm going to use the package uh, read r. I'm going to use the function read the limb. Yeah? And the reason why I do that is because I want to be able to explicitly um, denote the column type of each uh, column in my data set. 
because if you don't do that, my experience is that R is going to store these columns as, as character variables, and then you need to transform them into numeric variables, and that's a bit of a, um, these, that's some extra work that you have to be uh, careful, careful about. So here I can directly define, I want all these uh, 10 columns in the data set, I want them to be stored as numeric information, and R will take care of that uh, right away, all right? In terms of the other uh, arguments that you see over here, so there is this um, separator uh, that is indicating uh, how are columns separated from each other. Here, that's just the spacing. And I can, uh, I or the way how I did it here is I do not um, read in the column names right away. So I, at first I say, okay, I'm gonna skip these column names. I'm gonna skip the first line. And then I'm gonna, uh, specify the names of the different columns uh, myself. This is also to, to avoid some, some difficulties that I had with uh, loading this data set. Now, there are plenty of other ways to, to do the same operation, but the idea is that you're going to create an object. It's called Belgium Mail one by one, and that's containing this uh, life table for, for Belgium hmm, over different years and for different uh, ages. And today we're especially going to work with the variables year, age, and then this MX for the central uh, death rate, right? I think that's essentially the ones that I will need in the first uh, part of the tutorial, okay? So do take into account, I pre-downloaded the live table. I did that uh, two days ago, yeah? And these uh, live tables available on the human mortality database, they are sometimes updated. So whenever you download the live table yourself, let's say in a couple of weeks from now, then some of the uh, statistics or some of the information in there might be already be updated, right? So it's important to, uh, to keep track of the date that you downloaded uh, this particular uh, live table. So that's what we need. Um, first of all, let, uh, let us explore this, um, this data frame a little bit so we know what kind of variables are inside this uh, data frame. We can call the variable names with the function names applied to our data frame Belgian mail one by one. We can also check like uh, which periods or which years are available in the life table. So if I look at the minimum of the variable year within my data set Belgian mail one by one, I see that my information starts in 1841. And if I look at the most recently available year of information, that's 2018. So that's pretty recent. Uh, which ages do I have? I'm going to go from zero to the maximum of my ages in the data set. That's 110. Uh, a slight comment here. If you originally download this, this text file from the human mortality database, it will list 110 plus. But this uh, plus, huh? that's, a, that's, a, that's a character, right? So um, it often creates problems if you um, import the data uh, because of this, this plus sign that is written, um, that, that's coming with the 110. So I just removed the plus sign and I stored the numeric variable 110 to denote this, this final age. Uh, but be aware that it's actually denoting all the ages starting from 110 on uh, and uh, perhaps older than uh, those. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, uh, as you can see, my observations here start in 1841. Now, of course, if I want to calibrate uh, the Big Carter model to this data set, this is way, these data from the 19th century, they are way too old, right? And they are not realistic um, to be used in a model to, to forecast uh, mortality rates for the near future, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a subset of my original data set and I'm going to specify from which year on I would like to use this, um, this information. And here I specify to start here at 1950, which is also pretty old. I wouldn't use that in, in practice. I would go for 1970 or 75 or something. Um, but here it's just for reasons of, of illustration. So let me start with 1950. And let me specify the end year as the most recently available year that is stored in my, uh, in my period, in my life table. So that was the year 2018, as we already discovered earlier on. Yeah. 
So what I'm doing here is I apply the filter function from the dplyr package or from the tidyverse um, packages. I apply this filter to my original data set and I uh, subset in such a way that I only select the years which are um, larger than or more recent than or equal to 1950, right? So I throw out the information that is referring to years uh, below 1950, okay? If you then quickly scan the data set, you will see that indeed you start with observations from 1950 on, and for every year you have information for all the ages registered, for, so from 0 to 110, then you'll get the next year, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how this data set is, uh, is built up, all right? So before we're uh, going to do that, so let me quickly uh, show this in, in R, how this uh, actually goes. And then you can also ask your uh, questions, if, if, if any. Right, so I'm going to go to R Studio. And on the GitHub, you will find um, a script that looks like this, which essentially contains all the, the coding steps that you discovered in my presentation. Okay. Um, so as you see here in the beginning of my script, I'm loading a few packages uh, which I need. So particularly the, the tidyverse, the demography package, and for forecasting with time series, I'm going to rely on the library forecast. So I'm going to load these packages. I'm also um, going to use the RStudio API package just to um, get a very uh, elegant way huh, to get my uh, working directory and to um, extract the working directory that refers to um, to the to the path. Uh, or sorry, I'm, I'm going to use this to extract the path um, where this R script is stored on my computer, uh, so so that such that I can easily use relative paths uh, starting from there, right? So if you would, if you would uh, check this, if you see, okay, this dir, what does it contain? So here is the scripts folder in, um, in the folder that I prepared to, to store this tutorial session. So now I know, okay, I'm in this particular path and I can use relative path names uh, starting from here yeah, to, to refer to my data sets. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna do here. Uh, so I'm going to load my data set with the read our package. I'm going to use the instruction that I, dis that I discussed uh, so far. And you see here that my file name is now a relative uh, path name, right? So what this double dot here means is uh, that I'm going to leave the folder scripts and I'm going to go one higher. Huh? So I'm going to go to the subfolder tutorial sessions with Xaringham. And in there, I'm going to pick the subfolder data, and there my life table is stored. So that's how you should you should read this, and this avoids that I would um, have to copy the complicated path names uh, over here. Yeah. So that's how I'm going to use it. So I'm going to load the data set. Uh, get some warnings here, um, but you can um, uh, basically ignore uh, these. I'm going to put the names right. I'm going to check those names. And I'm going to look, OK, what's the minimum, the maximum of the periods of the variable year? So that's what we discussed. We go from 1841 up to 2018. What are the ages that we need? And I'm going to filter my data set so that I only use recent uh, data, right? So if you go for a head of Belgium male, then you'll now see what the structures of this, of this uh, data set. I'm going to start in 1950. I've got all my ages. I've got the MX. I've got the QX. I've got the AX. We didn't discuss that, but I've got the LX and the DX. This is something we covered. And at the end, I also have the period uh, life expectancy. Yeah. And so this was a table I downloaded uh, right away from the human mortality database. It's, um, it's a very classic uh, life table setting, so that's what I uh, will start with. Any questions on this? If that makes sense to you, just uh, maybe give me a thumbs up or something, or just say it's okay, then I know that I can uh, continue.
That's okay. All right. So you can um, play with that yourself. And we're going to use this data set now to uh, work with the Lee Carter model. And first of all, I'm going to calibrate this Lee Carter model with what I call here an iterative least squares approach. So this is one of the strategies, calibration strategies that we also um, uh, this, that we discussed in the, in, the, in the class as well. So I'm going to show you here how you can put that together in, in R. Okay. So here we go. This is uh, the idea. So we're going to assume uh, the following parametric expression for the log of the death rates, the central death rates MXT. So the Lee Carter describes that we're going to express these death rates as the exponential of an age-specific intercept, that's the beta x1, plus an age-specific slope, beta x2, multiplied with a period effect uh, or a period parameter kappa t2, right? And so the whole idea is about how to calibrate these uh, beta x1, beta x2, and, and kappa t2. And at first, we're going to do that very simple. Uh, by putting up this uh, loss function that you see over here. So this is a sum of square differences. Um, the log of MXT, these are observed because in our life table that we just um, read imported in, in R, we can find these observed values of the MXTs, right? So these are my observations and this is my model expression as uh, prescribed by Lee Carter for these uh, death rates. And so the whole idea is that I set up a routine to minimize this thing, right? Um, and we already discussed in class, so that looks a little bit like linear regression, but it is not because I do not have an observable covariance at this side of my uh, expression, right? So the whole uh, sp uh, specification here from Lee Carter is using parameters. Huh? There is nothing that is an observable covariate. So I cannot right away implement um, a linear model or a traditional least squares uh, approach. So we need to be able to find a solution for that. And the way how we're going to do that is by using an iterative uh, strategy. So first of all, and this is something we already discussed in class, we've got an analytic expression for the beta x1. Yeah? So for the estimates of the beta x1. And in class, we already derived this huh, by taking the derivative uh, with respect to beta x1 of this uh, loss function from the previous uh, slide. And then you'll see that you get this kind of uh, expression. So this is the time average of the observed um, logarithm of the, of the death rates. Yeah? So this is something I could implement, I could program, I could get that right away. But the more difficulty or the, the, the difficulties come with estimating the other parameters, so the beta x2 and the kappa t2. And in order to do that, we're going to define a new response variable. And that's the original response variable at log scale minus this beta hat x1, uh, right? So for all my observations in the life table that we just, um, uh, that we just observed in, in R, we're going, to, uh, we're going to subtract from the logarithm of the death rate, we're going to subtract the appropriate age-specific uh, intercept. And of course, you have to do that carefully because you have to make sure that for each record, you pick uh, the right beta to, to subtract. Okay, so what do I mean with, um, and once I've got these new uh, responses, I'm going to iteratively solve for the beta x2 and the, and the kappa t2. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, in, in this step number one, either you program this expression uh, directly, or another way to get the age-specific uh, intercept is that you ignore the second term, uh, the one with the beta x2 and the kappa t2 in your Lee Carter expression. And if I may go back to this criterion, if I ignore this part of the expression, then what I have is a linear uh, regression model. It's a linear regression model with an age-specific uh, intercept. So if I'm willing to ignore the terms with a superscript two, then I can use my linear model specification available in R. And then the only thing I need to do is to fit this um, age-specific intercept. Yeah, so that's going to work. 
So that's my approach for step number one. And then in step number two, what I basically will do is I will fix the beta x2s and I'm going to estimate the kappa t2s. And then the other way around, I'm going to fix the kappa t2s and I'm going to estimate the beta x2s. And if I'm willing to fix one of them, then if I look back at this criterion, if I'm willing, for instance, to fix the beta x2, then I've got an observable covariate. And then I can use a linear uh, regression approach to estimate the kappa t2s. And then if I fix the kappa t2s, then I've got again a linear uh, regression specification. I can use this to estimate the beta x2s. So that's what we're going to do iteratively. We're going to define a stopping criterion. And if the stopping criterion no longer um, improves or if that is satisfied, then we're going to stop our iterations. Okay. So that's one way to do it. There are probably other ways, but that's uh, the one I want to show you uh, right now. So here we go. Let us uh, first of all look at the estimates for um, the beta x1s. So for beta x1, I've got an age-specific intercept for each age in my data set. And as I said, we're going to do that by ignoring the other um, parameters in our Lee Carter model and by relying on ideas from linear uh, regression modeling. Um, Okay, so obviously uh, you see a little visitor in the background, but he's uh, going to leave. All right, um, so what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to use these ideas from, from linear regression. And I do that here in, in two different ways. So let me start with the last one. I think that's the most easy one to understand. I'm going to rely on the LM function for linear modeling. And I'm going to fit a model of y. And what is y? That's the log of the mx, so the central death rate. I'm going to do y versus, I'm going to leave out the overall intercept because I do not want to have a global intercept. Instead, I want to have an age-specific intercept. And the way how you can do that is by treating the variable h in your uh, data set as a factor variable. And then this model will estimate a, uh, an age-specific uh, intercept for your, um, for your log of your uh, death rates. Yeah? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run this linear model. And by typing then dollar sign coif, I'm going to extract the fitted coefficients. And these are going to be my uh, alpha or my beta 1 parameters that you see visualized uh, over here. So this is what I got for uh, the Belgian male data from 1950 to 2018. If I do this Lee Carter and if I extract the beta x1s, the age-specific uh, intercepts. Then what is the other implementation that you see over here? Well, if you don't like to rely on this LM function because it gives you a lot of uh, messages and interaction and so on, then you can also program this yourself. You put the model matrix of your linear regression model together. How to do that, again, includes age as a factor variable. Do not include the general intercept. So that, that's what this minus one indicates, and that you do not want a global uh, intercept. Uh, and then you're just going to apply these uh, traditional formulas from linear regression. So these are the analytic, that's the analytic expression that I know for the beta heads in a linear uh, regression model, for the parameter estimates in a linear regression model. So that is x transpose times x um, inverse uh, multiplied with x transpose multiplied with uh, the response uh, y, right? If you check that yourself, you'll see that both the alpha s, uh, what I call here alpha s so explicit, and the alpha estimates uh, that they exactly coincide. Also take a moment to look at the dimension of your X matrix. So this X has dimensions 7,659 times 111. Yeah. Uh, and so that is here because this is my number of records because I started in 1950. I've got one record for each age. I've got 111 ages in total. Huh? Um, so one record for every age every year. And then the 111, that's because I have these 111 ages and thus the 111 dummy variables that I need to, to organize uh, 
this. Okay, so this is what we get for the age-specific uh, intercepts. Let me continue. Uh, we're going to go for the kappas then in the next step. And I already explained this uh, routine that we're going to set up. But in order to initialize the routine, uh, we're going to first get some initial values or starting values for our kappa parameters. And in order to get those, we'll create the new response, the z. So what is my z? That's the log of my central death rates. And then I'm going to subtract the appropriate age-specific intercept. All right. And now you have to be careful because you're going to extract, OK, which um, if I take a record from my uh, MX variable, then I want to know which age uh, is, is corresponding to this, this record and which parameter estimate um, should I subtract from this, uh, from this uh, record? And here you have to be a bit uh, careful because, for instance, age zero, uh, that is in a year, the first, um, the first um, sorry, if you look at age zero, the parameter corresponding to age zero, that's the first parameter estimate that is stored in my vector alpha est. Yeah? So if this age would be zero, what I'm going to get here is then zero minus yeah, the minimum age, but I start from zero. So that's zero minus zero plus one, because I need the first estimate from my alpha vector then if I'm looking at uh, age zero. So that's something you always have to keep in mind. Uh, we're, we're creating here a vector with uh, age specific parameter estimates, but the vector is index, indexed from one on, but the first entry corresponds to age zero. Yeah? So, so you have to be very careful here that you subtract the, the right parameter from each uh, record in the, in the variable mx here. And then we put that together. We've got the z's now. Um, so look at my initial value for the kappa estimates. What I'm going to do is I'm going to regress the z and I'm going to treat the years as a factor variable. I'm going to ignore or I'm going to remove the global intercept. So that's the minus one here. And I'm going to ask to fit a, a year-specific uh, intercept here. This is just to initialize the kappas. Huh? So these are not final estimates, but these are just to initialize my kappa parameters. And that's what you see uh, over here, starting from 1950. If I do the same for the betas, I'm going to apply the same reasoning. Hmm? Uh, but now, since I already have the estimates or initial estimates for my kappas, I'm going to use that information, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vector, which is called here var kappa. And this var kappa has the same length as my original data set, as my original life table, as my z, as my um, data set I'm working with. And in this var kappa, I'm just going to put for each record in my life table, what is the corresponding kappa uh, estimate? Okay, so that means that if you start from uh, the year 1950 on, huh, then you're gonna ups, ups, um, then you're gonna get here 1950 minus the minimum year observed. That's 1950 again plus one. So then you're gonna work with the first kappa from your uh, vector of estimated uh, values. Yeah? So this coding here is a little bit subtle, but it's because we start from 1950 on, and we want to yeah, pick then the first uh, entry from our estimated uh, kappa vector. If we're working with 1951, we want to get the, the second entry from our kappa vector, and so on and so forth. So once I have that, I've got a vector with the same length as my data set which uh, stores uh, for each record in the data set uh, the corresponding uh, kappa estimate as obtained so far. And how do I get then initial values for the betas? Well, look at the expression over here. I'm going to run a linear model of my z's. I'm going to remove the intercept once again. And now I'm going to build the interaction between the age variable treated as a factor variable and the, um, the continuous variable, uh, which I stored in my var kappa so far. Okay, So that is, in fact, saying I'm going to treat the kappas as if they are observable uh, covariates. And I'm going to build an interaction 
with the factor variable age so that I'm estimating an age specific uh, slope. Uh, and that's going to be an initial value for the beta x2. So it's a little bit subtle, but it's using the tools from linear uh, regression model in a, in a clever way. So here again, you'll see the results. So we recognize this shape. Um, this is what we get for the beta x2s as initial values, right? So this is just a first step, if you want, uh, to initialize our different uh, parameter uh, vectors. And then the actual routine looks like this. So this is something we put together ourselves. So what we're gonna do is, um, while there is um, the convergence is put, um, while we didn't reach convergence yet, huh, uh, we're gonna repeat these steps that we just documented, right? So we're gonna create this var beta, we're gonna create this var kappa, and we're gonna uh, run a linear regression model where we, for instance, keep the var beta fixed as an observable covariate and calibrate um, year specific uh, slopes, uh, the kappa t's, that interact with this, um, with this, um, with this var beta in which we stored uh, the beta x2 parameters calibrated so far. And for the kappas, we do it the other way around. So, um, Sorry, uh, this was to estimate the kappas and to estimate the betas, we do it the other way around. So we click, we fix the kappa estimate so far, and we cal calculate each specific slopes uh, interacting with, this, um, with these values stored in the variable var kappa. And how do I specify the convergence here? Well, it's up to you how you want to define that, but here we're just gonna check uh, element-wise what is the difference between the new value for the beta and the old value compared to uh, the old value for the beta that we started with? And we want to make these absolute differences very small. And once we achieve that, um, we're gonna um, we're gonna stop the iteration. Huh? So that's something we put together over here. So this is then what I got for my betas. Um, I included the starting values and I forgot, I should have put a legend here, but I forgot which one is uh, which. We're going to see that in the code right away. And these are my kappas if I, where I'm comparing the starting values with my final estimates after reaching uh, convergence. Yeah. So that's what, uh, that's what we're doing. Um, there is one last step to discuss and that's the whole idea of uh, implementing the parameter uh, constraints, because up to now we didn't put any constraints um, in this whole uh, optimization procedure. And we know that the parameters in the cart, they are not identifiable. Huh? So we need these um, two constraints in order to identify the parameters in, in the model, right? So how do I apply these constraints? This is something we discussed in class. So with the resulting parameter estimates stored in beta est, so these are the beta x2s, uh, I'm going to divide them by their sum such that I've got a vector beta est ls that sums to one. And with the kappas, I'm going to do this kind of uh, transformation. And then to compensate these transformations, I also have to adjust my alphas or my uh, beta x1s, and that's done in this way. Right, so this is something we discussed in class. These formulas are on the, on the sheets. And you can see here that indeed the sum of the betas is now equal to one, and the sum of the kappas is equal to zero, let's say. It's a very small number. So in the end, I'll get the following results. If I look at 1950 to 2018 and my final estimates. So I see here the clear, um, age behavior uh, in my mortality profile. I see here that there is a decreasing trend in the um, mortality uh, rates, in the death rates. And I hear, see here that some ages are more sensitive to these um, evolutions over time and to these improvements in the mortality, in the mortality statistics. Some ages are more sensitive uh, than others, right? That's the role of this beta X2. If you do the same code once again, and you start from 1970, you'll get results like this. So I can adjust my calibration period uh, the way I want it to, to be, okay? 
So that's what I wanted to say about the least squares uh, implementation. So I'll just take a moment now to show this uh, in, in, uh, with the code in, in R, and then um, take a moment to answer your questions. Right? So we've got our data here, and I'm gonna start from uh, section one in the code about the least squares approach the iterative, iterative uh, setting. And first of all, I'm going to create my estimates for beta x1 or alpha. So I'm going to do this by defining the log of the central death rates. I'm going to put my model matrix x together, and then I can get my alpha parameters like this. Yeah. So if you want to see this, so if you do alpha est explode, then you'll see that indeed my routine was treating h as a factor variable and it gives me one parameter per uh, h in the data set, uh, per h observed in my data set, right? If I want to do this with a linear modeling uh, with the lm function, I can do the same thing. I extract the coefficients uh, right away and I can ask, Let's only print the first six values. I'll get something like this. And if you compare that with the results with the explicit coding, you indeed see that you get exactly the same numbers, uh, obviously, right? So that's how I get my, my alphas or my beta x1s in the, in the Lee Carter uh, model, yeah? So sorry about the perhaps confusing notation, but beta x1, that's what we use in the literature typically. Uh, but alpha is a bit easier if you need to code it, uh, because otherwise we have, we have beta x1, beta x2, that gets confusing uh, every now and then. In order to visualize my uh, parameter estimates, I create a table where I've got the different ages, I've got the corresponding uh, alpha estimates or beta x1 estimates. I put these together, I create a data set and a GG plot, and if you look over here, you'll see that these are my parameter estimates as I uh, as I already showed them in the um, in the sheets, right? So then we continue with our first uh, initialization uh, of the uh, the kappas and the beta x2. So be careful; this is just to initialize their values. So what I'm doing is I'm going to look at my Belgium male MX, and I'm going to subtract the appropriate alpha parameter estimate. Huh? So just be careful if you look at this head of, um, yeah, let's say Belgium, Belgium male, right? So just be careful huh? in the first uh, row, you've got H0, so you want to subtract here the first entry from the vector alpha then you've got H1 and so on and so forth. But of course, once you went through all the observations related to 1950, and then you'll have to start again with, um, um, with the next year of observations uh, where H0 will pop up again uh, and so on. Yeah? So just be careful that you subtract the right values. Uh, we put these together so that we can get initial values uh, for the kappas. So if I look now at my kappa est, okay, then you'll see that for each year in my data set, I got the uh, period effect parameter, which is calibrated here. Okay. I can picture that as well. Do take into account that these are just starting values uh, of my um, of my routine. So these are my initial values for the parameters uh, kappa t two, and then I'll do the same. Um, I'm going to create this var kappa. So essentially, uh, what I'm doing here, if I look at the length of this vector var kappa, is that I get a very long vector. Hmm? with uh, 7,659 entries. And that is, of course, the same number of rows as my original data frame, right? So this var kappa, it's really a long vector where for each record, 
from my original data set Belgian male, I store the appropriate kappa parameter. And then the whole idea is to use this var kappa as an observable covariate in your linear model and to build the uh, H-specific slope, slopes interacting with this observable covariate. So if I get the betas, then you'll see that I've got a, a beta parameter estimate for each H in the data set. Again, I can picture those. So these are my starting values. Um, these are the beta, beta hat X2s. Okay. So then the actual routine follows here. So you recognize here these two steps where I'm basically iterating. I keep the beta X2s fixed and I estimate the kappas or I keep the kappas fixed and I estimate the beta X2. So that's the way how I iterate. That's the way how this uh, while routine is gonna, it's gonna work. You'll also see that that's gonna go quite quickly. So the routine has already converged and I can then put my parameter estimates, my original ones. Uh, the original ones, so the initial, initial ones are in red and the final ones after reaching convergence are in black. Um, and here I just do that for the betas. Ah, I somehow um, left out the code where I do this for the kappas, but that goes in, the, in a similar way, right? And then I'll do the, um, I'll apply the constraints. So I'm gonna do a slight transformation of my resulting parameter estimates. And finally, I visualize all the obtained parameter estimates on one graph. So you'll get something like this. So if I zoom into that, and then I remember that I need to share another screen with you. So then we get something, oops, that's not good. Plot zoom, sorry. Um, then that's the one we uh, obtained, right? Voilà. So that's the one we now obtained with this uh, least squares uh, routine starting from uh, 1950. Okay, so it's the first thing I wanted to show. Any questions here? Or any? Ideas, feedback, if not. So let me briefly uh, recap what we did um, so far. So I loaded this uh, life table from the human uh, mortality data set, database, sorry. Uh, it might be good, and I think I've got the website open. So let me just show you where I got this life table from. Voila. So here is the human uh, mortality database. This is Belgium. Yeah, so this is what I've got for Belgium. And I essentially downloaded the life table that you see over here. Pick the one for males. So this is the one one life table. So if I would click on it, um, I think it's gonna open here. So that's essentially the one that I, that I downloaded uh, and that I put as a TXT file in your uh, course documentation, yeah. Um, so for us, that's good to start huh? because we only need the death rates per age per year to calibrate this uh, Leap Carter, uh, to calibrate this uh, Leap Carter model. Yeah. So once we had the data, we put this loss function together, which looks like a, which is a squared uh, squared difference, and then we set up a clever way to to optimize this uh, this loss function. But next to the um, least squares implementation that we discussed so far. And I want to take the step towards um, getting the Poisson likelihood and then maximizing this uh, Poisson likelihood, right? So that's the first thing I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to do this approach. And then we're going to end with um, looking at forecasting methodologies and, and see how we can uh, fit the random walk with drift and how to use that for forecasting, all right? So here we go. Um, you may remember from the lecture notes that um, it is a, it's a good idea. It's in general a, a very good strategy 
to write down this uh, Poisson likelihood for the number of deaths at hx in a certain period uh, t to write down the likelihood and to optimize this uh, likelihood. Because then, of course, you can use the whole machinery that comes with uh, maximum likelihood estimation, right? So here is our uh, likelihood specification. I'm going to do a Poisson with as the mean of my Poisson, I'm going to take the exposure to risk, multiply it with the mu. And this mu is my force of mortality. So I'm going to propose the uh, Lee Carter specification for this uh, force of mortality. OK, and if I then write down the log likelihood, this is something we did in the lecture sheets, then you recognize the uh, expression over here. So that's the one we want to um, maximize. OK. What are the observed uh, elements in these expressions? Well, the Ds and the Es. These are the ones we uh, have available from the human mortality uh, database or from our National Statistics Institute. We can get those and, and use them in the, in the likelihood. Okay. So here we go. Uh, first of all, where to find my uh, where to find my data? So here I'm going to illustrate this uh, differently because I'll need the information on the number of deaths, and I'll need information the exposure to risk or a kind of population size, right? So I'm going to use this demography package again. Uh, we already discussed that last week, so I'm going to specify that I want to work with Belgian data. The acronym for Belgium in this demography package is BEL, referring to Belgium. I'll need a username and I'll need a password in order to connect with the human mortality database. And then I can use the function hmd.mx to um, get a meaningful set of information containing, among others, the number of deaths and the, and the rates, right? So here I'm going to call my function hmd.mx. I'll need to specify the acronym for my country. I need to specify my username, my password, and the label for the country that I'm working with, right? What I'm also do is uh, once that I downloaded this data and stored them in the uh, data frame DF, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to restrict my years to be used, and I'm going to restrict the ages that I want to consider in the data set. And here I do this by saying, OK, I want to start in the year 1970, and I want to go to the most recent year available. And in terms of the ages, I want to go from 0 to 89. So that's something we typically do uh, because for older ages, huh, we're going to use these uh, closing the mortality uh, table strategies by Canisto, for instance. Now, uh, one way to subset the original data set stored here in DF so that you only have those years and those ages is to use the built-in functions, uh, extract years and extract ages. Huh? And I think the name already uh, tells you what these functions are doing. So they just allow me in a very quick way to subset my data so that I only have specific uh, uh, calibration period available and a specific range of ages uh, available. Yeah? So that's what I do here. And you see that after running these steps, my minimum year is 1970, and my maximum age is 89 in my data set as it should be. So that's what we're going to do. If you look at the information inside this uh, data set, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the DF and then dollar sign pop for population size, dollar sign male. So then I've got the population size for the male population. That's what I'm going to use as my exposure to risk, right? Uh, and you'll see that the dimension of this matrix is then 49 by 90. So 90, that's the number of ages that I'm considering because I'm going from 0 to 89. And 49, that's the number of years or periods that I have in my data set because I go from 1970 to 2018. And then for the number of deaths, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the exposures with the, with the rates. So these are the M, M, uh, MTX or MXTs. Uh, and you know that the MXTs are, in fact, the deaths divided by the exposures. So that's how I get the rates, um, how I get the deaths uh, over here. Now, I do realize that this is a bit of a 
quick and dirty uh, way. So it might, if you would do this really for a, a practical application or for your assignment or something, I'm going to go back to the human mortality database again. And um, yeah, yes, that's, uh, that's here. Because in hindsight, uh, it would have been nicer. Oops. It would have been nicer if I would have used. Voila. In hindsight, it would have been nicer if I would have used uh, really what is here listed as the deaths combined with the exposure to risk. Uh, so if I would download these as separate uh, separate TXT files and put them together, that would have been a, a slightly better way compared to what I did now, where I have my, um, my population size, where I have my um, rates loaded from this human mortality database with the hmd.mx uh, function. Yeah? So the reason, and what I wanted to show here is once again, how to use this demography package function at the hmd.mx. But um, the limitations of these is that you are really, that you really have to stick to these kind of settings, which you see here. And in fact, you're using then the population size, which is slightly different from the uh, exposure to risk, though it's very close. Uh, and you're going to put your, your debts together your, yourself using, um, using these kind of uh, operations. Yeah. So it, it would have been slightly better to, to download the debts and the exposure to risk uh, separately from the human mortality database and, and to work with these. So what I will do is I will add this to the sheet so that you see the appropriate instructions to do that. And then you can also work uh, with this. But conceptually, this is what I need. I need the ETX and I need the DTX. And once I've got those, uh, I can start working with my Poisson uh, likelihood. Yeah, so that's what I want to illustrate right now. OK, so before we uh, continue, let me first show you some nice uh, visuals. So what you see here is that working with these um, DTX and these ETX. What I'm going to show you here is the log of the central death rate versus age. And I'm going to use different colors for different years or for different decades or something. Yeah. So this is a graph which you may recognize, which is, is, is looking quite uh, similar to graphs we already discussed earlier on. So you clearly see that here starting in the 70s huh, with the red colored lines, uh, we realized a very substantial improvement in uh, mortality rates. Um, and nowadays, uh, we're looking at these magenta or these purple lines in uh, 20, 2010, 2020. Okay. So how to do this plot? Well, you see that here on the, on the, on the left side. So what I put together is a data set where I have the years, where I have the ages and the corresponding uh, rates, yeah. Um, so you have to be careful here with the dimensions hmm? um, because in the end, I want to, if you initially look at my, at my rates, my DTX divided by ETX, they are in matrix form. Hmm? Uh, that's what we've seen over here. Their dimensions are like this. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to treat them as a vector so that I've got um, H0 for all the years, then I've got H1 for all the years, et cetera. And that's what I'm going to use uh, here. And the, the trick here to do this ggplot is then to specify the group variable, which I, which I specify here as the year, so that each group gets a different uh, color in my, in my ggplot. And the different colors I want to use, I'm specifying them here. So I use a rainbow palette with up to 10 colors to, to visualize this. OK, so let us uh, take a brief moment to do this in, in R. So if I switch to R Studio, so then I'm here uh, entering the GLM formulation. I'm going to load my package demography. I'm going to load my data set, store these in the data frame df 
and I'm going to subset my data sets by extracting the calibration period I want to use and by extracting the uh, ages I want to use. Okay, so that's what I can do over here. I'm going to subset my data set and I can check, okay, what's the minimum year, what's the maximum year and so on and so forth. So if I now would see what is the, the way how this data set look, looks like, then I'll get something, get something like, like this. Uh, so this is my head of DF. Uh, there's quite a lot of stuff in here uh, because I've got different entries. I've got the total population. I've got the population size for males and females uh, separately. Um, so you see, uh, there is a lot of information stored in this object. You can quickly access that with the structure, structure of DF. And then you'll see that you've got a list with the type, with the label, with the years, with the ages, with the population sizes and with the rates. Yeah, and then the rates and the population sizes for, for female, for male and for total. So that's what I'm gonna use uh, today. So I extract the ETX and the DTX from here, yeah, these dimensions. And to do my plot, I'm going to do the manipulations like this. So um, just to show you what I'm doing here, I'm putting a grid together with the years and the ages. So you'll see here that I've got age zero throughout my whole calibration period. Then I'll got get uh, H1 over my complete um, calibration period and so on. But if I look at the rates, then I'll get as the dimensions of the rates, this uh, matrix structure, so 49 uh, rows and 19 columns. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna treat these rates as a vector. Yeah, and then you'll see that these are stored as a vector and it's in fact a vector that starts with um, H0 over the whole calibration period, then H1 over the whole calibration period and so on. But there's something you have to check because that's not immediately clear, but, but you can check that that is indeed uh, the way how the data are structured. Right, so in the end, I have a data frame. I also call it DF. Um, and this looks as follows. So I've got the years, I've got H0 then, and I've got the corresponding log. So that is suitable to be used for my ggplot, which creates the rainbow, the rainbow plot as follows. Um, voila. So that's the one you've seen in the uh, lecture sheets. That's the one we constructed and shows how our rates are evolving uh, over time. Okay, any questions here? So essentially what we did is uh, we got our information on the number of deaths and um, the exposures. I've got it here using this demography package. Um, in principle, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's better if you di directly load the, the deaths and the exposure to risk a data set from the human mortality database. So that's uh, an alternative way to, to do it. If that makes sense, uh, then we're ready to look at the calibration of our uh, Poisson uh, likelihood. So we're going to continue here, voila. And we're going to see how to optimize this uh, Poisson likelihood with what we call univariate uh, Newton Refson steps. Yeah. And in the, uh, in the code, we're going to see two ways to do this. We put together our own routine, or better, Bavo put it together for you. So I'm going to cover that. Um, that's a function that takes as the entries the DXTs and the EXTs, as it should be. And it allows you to specify a certain uh, tolerance level, a certain maximum number of iterations. That's a function you can work with. And then on the other hand, I'm going to show you a very uh, famous implementation by the team of uh, Professor Kearns. Um, which is a script called fitmodels.r, which does not only contain an implementation of, of Lee Carter via the Poisson uh, likelihood, but also of the different other, uh, or quite a substantial number of other life metrics models that we met in class.
that's like the CBD model, the Renshaw Haberman model, uh, stuff like that. Right, so we're gonna say a few words about this script. And then for Lee Carter, Lee Carter, remember that's model M1 huh, from our list of uh, life metrics uh, models. So we've got the fitting routine that is called FIT7701, where you can um, give us as arguments, the ages, the years, the ETX, the DTX, uh, a vector of weights if you want to be used in the likelihood. So this would be a vector of weights. Um, and then the univariate uh, Newton refs and steps will be taken care of. Yeah. So, um, like I said, this is a function that was developed as part of the Life Metrics uh, project. It's still available online, this uh, implementation. And I'm going to direct you to um, the place where you can find this, um, this, this coding. So, here, if you follow the link in my sheets, this is the Life Metrics open source R code for stochastic mortality modeling. So you'll see here a user guide, you'll see here the open source R code. So that's the one that I'm, uh, that I'm using for this, uh, for this tutorial. Yeah? So the open source code was previously available as the www.lifemetrics.com project, but that was then taken over by another organization, etc. So now this website is the place to go if you wanna read a bit uh, more about this. Okay, so that's the background. That's where this implementation is coming from. And I want to show you today how to use this um, implementation in, for our purposes. So like I said, um, when we go to R in a couple of minutes from now, you'll see that if we dive into this script, this fitmodels.r script, there will be a couple of different uh, functions available there. FIT701 is for Lee Carter, FIT702 is for the Renshaw Haberman model, FIT703 is for the H period cohort mod model, FIT705 for the CBD model, and so on and so forth. So, this is like a toolbox um, where Professor Kearns and co authors put an implementation together of these different uh, life metrics models that we discussed in class. Yeah? All are single population models. So if you want to use this for multi-population modeling, you'll need to put the appropriate uh, building blocks together yourself. Now, what is essential? Uh, we're going to do these newton Refson steps. Um, and we discussed that in the class. Huh? So in the class, we said, OK, for instance, for the kappa parameters, we're going to do the following kinds of uh, iterative steps, uh, which are basically coming from taking the derivative of the Poisson likelihood with respect to this uh, kappa, putting that equal to zero, right? So that derivative, that's um, what you get oops, in the um, uh, numerator of this expression. And then here, taking again the derivative with respect to the kappa, uh, you'll get uh, the expression in the uh, denominator, right? Here I use the notation in terms of alpha x, beta x, and kappa t, because that avoids me to use the sub superscript uh, 1 and 2, and that saves me some space uh, over here. So if you look, for instance, in the FIT701 implementation, then the function in the script, the function ll max 2 d uh, does this newton Refson step for the period effect. Because if I look at this expression, you'll recognize something like this. So K21, so the new, the updated K2, or kappa 2, is the previous one minus F0 divided by df0. And what is this F0? That's this expression, right? So it's a little bit obscure, but if you put all these guys together, yeah, then you'll recognize the expression that you've got here on top. So the only thing you have to take into account then is that um, you'll see here this B3 times G3. Well, for the Lee Carter model, that is equal to zero because that refers to a cohort effect and a third component in our model specification. But for Lee Carter, this guy is going to be zero, so that's going to be uh, that will be dropped from the from the expression. So the job here is that you take a look at these these kind of steps or implementations and try to link it to the um, Newton Refson steps that we've seen in the class that you see here on, on the sheet. And I must say that 
from time to time, I give, I give you on the exam um, code chunks. So for instance, this fit 701 function, including steps like these. Uh, and then I really ask you to, to make sense of this uh, implementation and to explain me uh, what is going on. So you really have to understand uh, what's going on uh, over there. Yeah. So if you see how we're going to uh, call this uh, function, well, first of all, we're going to load the script fitmodels.r. So in uh, R, you can do that with the source function. And then we're going to call this function fit701. We're going to specify the ages we want to use, the years we want to use, the ETX, TTX matrix. And then we're going to give as weights, weights all equal to one. So that means we're going to treat each observation equally. Uh, you could have perhaps reasons huh, to, to give different weights to different uh, ages or years or something. But here, uh, we're just going to give these weights uh, down to one. Then the routine will start doing the optimization. And in the end, what we get back, so if we look at the names of what is stored in this, uh, in this object, in this resulting object, we've got the beta 1, we've got the beta 2, we've got the beta 3. Um, the kappa 2 and the gamma 3. Huh? Now for Lee Carter, we have to be careful because of course the beta 3 is going to be 0 and this gamma 3 is also going to be 0. So for Lee Carter, we're only considering the beta 1, beta 2 and the kappa t. We can also look at the, um, the BIC for instance, that is um, the big criterion. Um, in which the optimal values of the parameters are used, the likelihood of the Poisson is used, and so on. We also get the uh, residuals back. These are stored in the object epsilon, and we get the fitted values of our um, central death rates. Uh, we get these as well. If you look at the implementation of the residuals, that's nice to see because we recognize here the expression for a Pearson residual, which we encountered in the class on on generalized linear models. And so you'll see here that this epsilon is going to be positive if the observed number of deaths is larger than what the model is expecting or predicting. And what is the expected number of deaths in my model or the fitted number of deaths? That's the exposure multiplied with the m hat for that year and that, that age, right? So if the residual, if the epsilon is positive, you're underestimating the number of deaths. If the epsilon is negative, you're overestimating. Yeah? So that's an interpretation we have to keep in mind when we're going to look into uh, residual plots. OK, so that's what I want to say here. You've got this whole uh, fitting routine available. Uh, and basically, it does the newton refson steps as we discussed them in, in class. And if I look at the results, uh, calibrated here from 1970 on, I'll get, uh, I get the beta x1s, I get the beta x2s, and the kappa 2s. That's what I uh, want to look at. Yeah. Um, so let's take a moment to show you how that goes in, in R and to show you where you can find the scripts that we need. Right. So we're here in the uh, demonstration. And we're going to source this script fitmodels.r. And I've got it open over here. So if you open this, um, this R script, you'll see this is the live metric software, certain license agreement, et cetera, et cetera. So this has to do with what uh, Andrew Kearns uh, describes on his website. You can read it over there. And then we'll see that we have this fit701 function, right? So this does model M1. It's the Lee Carter model. And what we're going to do is the following specification, including Poisson error. Okay. We see that the um, XV are as a vector of ages, YV is a vector of years. We've got ETX, and they also specify the dimension. Uh, so what you should put in the rows, what you should put in the columns. We've got the DTX, and we've got our weight uh, matrix. So weights are 0 or 1. Um, in this setting, so one if you want to include the observation, zero if you want to exclude the observation. For instance, because there is some measurement problems or um, the data is not reliable or whatever. Okay, and then you'll see a large implementation. So let me just uh, show you some highlights 
uh, we get first initial estimates. Uh, we'll see that we're going to iterate until the difference between two values of, or two consecutive values of the log likelihood is smaller than 10 to the power minus four. Uh, so that's the convergence criterion that, uh, uh, that the authors of this instruction are using. Uh, so we're going to continue to iterate if the improvement in the log likelihood is above um, 0 0.0001, right? And then here, what is important is that you recognize these functions, L, L max, M to B, we do, L, L max, M to D, okay? Um, and then here you've got the analytic expressions uh, for the beta tensors. So this specification of the LL max M2D, if you would like to look at that one, you'll have to search it. LL max M2D, right? So if I go further on, at, I think at the bottom of the screen of the, of the implementation of the script, I'll see how that function is working and I'll recognize here my Newton Raphson steps. And these are the ones that I discussed on the, on the sheets uh, with you, okay? So that's how it goes. Um, this is complicated. This is, a, it's, a, it's a long code, so it's a bit overwhelming if, if you look at that, but just try to highlight the most essential parts from it and try to make sense out of these. You'll also see that you've got FIT 702 for Renshaw Haberman. Uh, you've got uh, fit 703 for the APC model um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so this is an implementation we've got at our, at our disposal. So if I just call this instruction in my script, then you'll see that the convergence is reached uh, very quickly. And from there on, I can use my calibrated uh, parameters. I could also use other insightful stuff. So I can do, for instance, what is the big value that I obtained for this model? So I've got my information criterion, I've got my residuals, uh, and so on and so forth. So if I plot the resulting parameter estimates, I get something like this. Yeah, but this is the kind of graphs that we um, already discussed and have already seen. Um, earlier on. Yeah, so these are the results of running this FIT701 routine on the Belgian, uh, the Belgian data. All right. Some uh, extra words on this same um, recipe is, yeah, if you find the steps in this uh, routine, the FIT701, if you find it a bit overwhelming, you can also look at the routine that Bavo put together, uh, to, which does essentially the same thing, but which is just a bit uh, less overwhelming, I would say. So that function is only available for Lee Carter in our um, uh, computer lab. It's called LCNROPT. It takes the DXTs, it takes the exposures. Uh, it also specifies a tolerance uh, level, a maximum number of iterations. And here again, uh, you'll recognize the univariate uh, newton refson steps, but perhaps these are a bit more um, easy to understand uh, because here you really recognize the kind of instructions, uh, the kind of steps that we already had on the, on the lecture sheets um, when we were discussing the calibration strategy for, for Lee Card. Yeah. So if you look at the parameter estimates uh, obtained with this routine, they look, um, very, very similar. So there are slight differences with the ones obtained with the FIT701 uh, routine due to different in initialization, etc. Uh, but they are very, very similar. Okay. So here we are. Any questions? Uh, if it makes sense, then just say, okay, it makes sense or... Um, it's okay. Yeah. So I wanted to show you how to do this with the, with the Poisson likelihood. Uh, of course, this is quite an extensive uh, code, so you'll, you'll need to take a moment to, to look more close into that. But 
the job is really to link this implementation to what we discussed in class. And that's, that would be really great if you could uh, reach that, uh, that level. All right. Uh, so there is one final part for us to do, and that is to uh, do the forecasting with the random walk with drift. But before we're going to do that, I included a few extra uh, plots, which, which I think are nice as visualizations of what we've been, uh, what we've been doing here. Yeah? So what you see over here is uh, looking um, very neat, I would say. But what we're actually doing here is we look at our ranges of age ages considered so from 0 to 89 we look at our calibration period so from 1970 to 2018 and i put together a, a, what is called the geom tile huh? so i've got a table or a tile for each observation in this um, in this uh, in this uh, plane hyperplane and uh, what i'm going to visualize here is my residual uh, the residual, the Pearson residual that comes with this uh, Luke Carter fit. And if this residual is blue, if it's dark blue, then it's negative, pretty negative. And it's, if it's yellow, then uh, the residual is positive, right? And the way how I put that together, you can see that over here. So again, I'm going to create a, a, a data set with the years, with the ages, with the corresponding epsilon. So the, the residuals that I calibrate with my FIT701 routine, and then I'm gonna picture those uh, residuals, right? Now, the reason that I do is, of course, um, similar to the way how you traditionally use uh, residual plots in linear regression or in uh, generalized linear uh, regression models, because you construct these residual plots to see if there are any trends left in your, um, in your residuals. And what you see here is, um, and I think that's, that's quite uh, striking is a bit of a, well, there is a, some specific uh, diagonals here huh, that pop up. And here you also see uh, a kind of diagonal, uh, a couple of diagonals colored in blue, and then a few which are more colored in, in green and in yellow. So that's a slide or that's some indication huh, that in this diagonal direction, that there is something going on there perhaps, right? And now, if you, of course, if you think about what is this diagonal, um, diagonal direction, well, that refers to the cohort in which uh, our individuals are born. Uh, for example, if we look at a 50-year-old in the year uh, 1990, then that is somebody who's born in the year 1940. And if you then look at a 51-year-old in the year 1991, that's again somebody born in the year um, 1940. Yeah? So we see here um that these diagonals represent uh, cohorts or birth years so if you still see some trends in those directions um, then that could be an indication to try to include uh, a cohort effect uh, cohort parameters in your uh, mortality uh, models so um, we already spent some time discussing in class why personally my experience uh, tells me that that's uh, uh, that it's typically very difficult huh, to, to start working with these uh, cohort effects, um, might become quite unstable, not robust, difficult to estimate, difficult to find the identifiability constraints, difficult to project, etc. cetera. Um, but okay, there is some work out there that tries to include these um, cohort uh, effects. And to continue a bit on that idea, I'm gonna make reference to a paper by, again, by uh, Andrew Kearns. Hmm? So if you want to read a bit more about these cohort effects, I can refer you to the, to the paper by Kearns et al. from 2009 called A Quantitative Comparison of Stochastic Mortality Models Using Data from England and Wales in the United States. So if you follow the link here, you will be directed to this paper. And I copy one graph from this paper here uh, where you've got the same setup. Uh, you've got ages, you've got years. And what the uh, authors uh, show here are not residuals, but they show improvement rates in mortality by calendar year and by age relative to the mortality rates at the same age in the previous year. So that means you take the MXT and you're going to compare it to the MXT minus one, right? And they call that the 
uh, improvement rate for a certain year, uh, for a certain age in a certain, certain year. And if you see if those improvement uh, rates are colored red in this graph, then mortality is deteriorating. If you look at um, green small rates of uh, green indicates small rates of improvement, and then blue and white are very strong rates of, of, of improvement, right? So the black line that they follow over here represents the progress of the 1930 cohort. So you see that along this black line, especially here, you'll see a lot of uh, blue cells. So you see strong improvements of, of mortality. Uh, so that is often used for the case of, of England and Wales as a motivation to um, explore the use of this, of this cohort effect. Huh? So that's what I write over here. It's often used as the rationale for including cohort effects in, uh, in mortality forecasting models. So it really depends on the country you're looking at, uh, the ages you're considering, the calibration period, uh, how strongly these um, cohort effects will be present. Um, and then yeah, so for my own work and the work I did with the Institute of Actuaries in Belgium and the Netherlands, we tried a lot of models with a cohort effect, uh, but we decided not to include one because it's very uh, unstable and difficult to work with. Uh, for certain UK uh, publications, you'll see because of graphs like these huh, that people um, do opt for a Renshaw Haberman model or for an age period cohort model where you include such a cohort uh, parameter yeah so that's the only thing i wanted to say about this um, it's good to investigate my attempts to include it were not so successful uh, but others have um, opted for for including those in a in a model yeah and residual plots mortality improvement plots like the ones you see over here they help us to identify whether uh, including such a cohort effect could make sense or not Okay, so to continue um, with this, so what I'm doing here is I pick four ages, 25, 45, 65, and 85, and I'm gonna visualize the mortality, the, the death rates, so the central death rates, uh, their observed values, these are the dots, and then the fitted values, that's the dashed line uh, over here. So you can see this as a kind of goodness of fit uh, inspection to see how close my fitted values are um, related to, with respect to my actual observations of these um, death rates. Yeah. So let us go back um, to our studio to show this. And so first of all, here is this uh, own written function that you can work with to calibrate the Lee Carter. And then I'm going to store my results in the object results. So you see results is a list containing the ages that I use to calibrate the Lee Carter model, the years used in the calibration period. And then I've got the beta ones, the beta twos and the kappa twos. So whenever I want to um, access the fitted parameters, I can do, for instance, results and then dollar sign kappa two. And then I get the fitted values for the kappas. Yeah. Uh, if I picture these fitted values, I can do that with the following lines of code. And then I'll see that I get my fitted Lee Carter parameter estimates. Yeah. Um, I discussed the residual plot, so let us just show how to do this. So here I see with the ggplot instructions that I can quickly do this. Um, visualization of my residuals with a color. Okay. Then the next set of instructions, um, these are just ggplots to do this goodness of fit, where I pick the four ages, pick the four ages and I visualize them um, over time. Uh, the fitted values and also the uh, realized uh, rates. So far, so good. Forecasting and remembering class what we did for the Lee Carter, uh, we're going to use our RIMA toolbox 
to find a suitable time series model for the fitted parameters of the kappa T2s. And because this um, parameter estimates that we get for the kappas, so if I, if I may, if I go back, you'll see that this is pretty, pretty much a straight line, right? So we're gonna do this random walk with drift. We're gonna calibrate that time series model to these uh, realized uh, parameter estimates, and we're gonna use that to, to project some scenarios uh, for the future, right? So that's the last step we need to take care of. So we wanna know, we do know which uh, time series model we wanna use. There are two unknowns here. I need to estimate the theta, the drift parameter, and I need to estimate the sigma square, which is the volatility of the, of the noise terms, right? And then if I use the most recently uh, observed or the most recent uh, value for my kappa two, then I can use this recipe to generate scenarios for the future, right? So I'm gonna show you how we can do that. Well, first of all, I'm gonna use the uh, forecast uh, library to fit the uh, random walk with drift model. Yeah? So I'm gonna use the function arima. I'm gonna apply it to my time series. And my time series here, uh, do be careful with that, but my time series here are the fitted parameters for the kappas. Yeah? So it's not an observed um, time series, it's what I obtain by calibrating the Ricardo. And then the ARIMA model that I wish uh, to calibrate, I'm gonna specify that with the following um, vector for the order. So in general, this order is gonna be of the type PDQ, where the P refers to the number of autoregressive terms you wanna include, D refers to differencing, and Q refers to the uh, moving average uh, order that you want to include. So we don't need the P and the Q for the random walk with drift. We only need the D and we difference once, right? Because we express kappa T as a function of the previous uh, value. Now, of course, if you would like to do this um, with a different time series specification, uh, then this is also the, the routine that you can use, but you have to pick the appropriate values for P, D, and Q then, of course. We're gonna include the drift, that's obvious, we, because we wanna do a random walk with drift. And if we look at the calibrated time series model, we'll see here that we've got our drift um, estimate. We've got the standard error that comes with the theta hat, and we've got our sigma square uh, estimated. We've got our log likelihood. We've got an AIC value, a BIC, et cetera. So we could use this to compare different uh, time series models, which are calibrated to the uh, kappa estimates, for example. Yeah, so that's how you can do it, pretty manual. Um, so I've got my, my forecast package, I got the RIMA routine, and I can put there the PDQ, I can put there include drift, include an intercept, I can do there whatever I want, um, and, and estimate the time series model that I want to use, right? So here I'm showing this for Lee Carter. I could also use this to do the autoregressive of order one in a Lee Lee setting, uh, if I uh, would like to do that. Okay. Now with the forecast um, function, that should be the forecast package, sorry. So with the forecast package, uh, I've got, I oh know, sorry, there is a forecast function as well that I wish to use now. I wanna apply it to the time series uh, object created. And that's essentially gonna um, project to the future. And here with the levels that I specify, so level 80, 85, and 95, I'm gonna specify the confidence levels for my prediction intervals over here. So if you look very carefully, you see, uh, of course, a dark blue uh, for, the, for the best estimate. So what happens if I put the epsilon, if I put the error terms uh, equal to zero? Uh, so that's the best estimate scenario. And then I've got in dark gray, the 80% uh, confidence level. And then slightly above that, I've got the 85% and then the 95% uh, confidence level. Yeah? Here that goes from zero to, I think it's 49. Uh, that has to do with the fact that I have the years 1970 up to 2018. And then from there on, I'm gonna project to the future. Yeah? So this is just the building function. 
uh, that I'm going to use as it is. I'm going to do my own uh, plotting functions and my own functions uh, from in the next uh, in the next steps. Yeah. So this is something we can do, uh, and we can use that to quickly calibrate our um, time series uh, specifications. Now another way to to work with it with uh, this is that we're going to use again the routines from the life metrics uh, project and next to the uh, fitmodels.r there is also a script called simmodels.r where we can do uh, where we can find a couple of useful simulation functions and so for example the sim 2001 uh, is is there to simulate from a fitted uh, Lee Carter model. Yeah, so I explain here how to call this function and what kind of useful arguments you can find um, to, to use the function over here. So you have to specify the age, ages used in the fitting procedure, the calendar years you used, you have to specify your parameters as calibrated for the Lee Carter model. You'll have to specify how many paths you want to generate. So do you want 100 paths? Do you want one, uh, 10,000 paths for the future? What is your forecasting horizon? That's the Tmax horizon uh, argument. So how far do you want to go ahead? And then n years, that's going to be the number of years you want to use to calibrate your random local drift model. Yeah? So remember what we said in class when we discussed the sensitivity of the random local drift with respect to the calibration periods uh, used. I, I gave there an example from my own research where we include uh, structural breaks, uh, the detection of structural breaks in, in the Lee Carter uh, time series model. Well, here you can also control that a little bit huh, with, these, with this argument and years. So you could start, for instance, um, from 1950 to calibrate Lee Carter, but you could then decide to to calibrate the random walk with drift only for the for the most recent uh, 30 years or something. So that's can, that can be done with this n years uh, round. Yeah. So here is how I call the function. So I'm gonna call this sim 2001, specify the ages, the years, the parameters we calibrated so far. I want 10,000 paths for the future. I wanna go 50 years ahead. And I wanna use all the years in my calibration period to fit my time series uh, model. And I'm going to store the results in the sim LC object. OK, so that's using this uh, built-in function. And of course, if we look then a bit into, yeah, what is this uh, sim LC object? What is it showing me? Well, here you see in the argument why we've got the most recent year available, 2018, right? So this is a year that we don't need a forecast for that because we actually observed it but that's what uh that's what we're going to start with right and that's of course because your random walk with drift starts from the most recent uh available estimates for your for your kappa and we're going to go all the way up to 2076 and then we have a couple of yeah interesting things which are stored in this SimLC object. So for instance, if you look at the argument DDA, then we'll see that that is a list of dimension 150, 10,001. So this 50 refers to the length of Y. So this, this refers to my uh, years. And the 10,001, that refers to, okay, for every uh, year, hmm? Uh, I've got my 10,000 um, scenarios. And then you will say, uh, why is it then 10,001? Because the first entry is going to be the best estimate scenario. So that's not a generated scenario, but that's the, the, the scenario that I get when I put the noise terms equal to zero in my random walk with drift. Yeah? And you'll see here that each path that is generated starts from the most recently uh, calibrated, observed, kappa t2. Uh, so that's this value minus 50.61649. That's also, if you look at the kappa t vector, that's the, the final entry in our vector. So we start from here, we generate an epsilon, we add the uh, drift term 
to that and we get a new value for our kappa. And then we start from here, we generate an epsilon, we add the drip term and so on and so forth. So that's how we create a path uh, from this random local drift um, model. Yeah. So that's important here. And then, so these are the paths for my kappas. And then what the routine also gives me is this argument QAA. So that's a list of dimensions 90, 50 to 10,001, where 90 is now the number of ages used in the calibration data set. Um, so this stores the QXTs for each HX and then the projected time horizon. We've got again the best estimate, we've got 10,000 generated scenarios. Okay, so these queues, these are directly the scenarios generated for each HX in the future. And if we plot that, um, let us take a look at this kind of uh, what we call a Fenn chart. So these are the kappas as calibrated by Lee Carter. And this is a Fenn chart that shows me the most likely scenarios for the future and then the, the less likely scenarios uh, for the future. So this is a function that is also available in this simmodels.r script. It's called fen. And you can apply it to the output of this uh, sim2001 routine. You can specify the color you want to use for the fen chart. And then you can see here what the outer limits uh, represent. So these are the 5%, 95%. 95% quantile for a given year. And so for every given year, I can rank all my scenarios and I can pick the, if I rank them from, from small to, to large, I can pick the 5% quantile value, the 95% quantile value and construct the bands uh, like this. Yeah. Uh, you also see that the darkest band here in the middle that's the 45% to 55% um, quantile, uh, quantile range. And I'm going to use here the available function in this uh, sim models uh, script, which is called FEN, and which actually produces this uh, FEN chart that you see over here. And with the first, yeah, the first part of my code, so these plotting instructions here, I'm visualizing the um, the calibrated uh, kappas here with the black uh, black dots over here, right? So that's these are the projected scenarios uh, for the kappas. Now, of course, you can also translate that to what are your projected scenarios uh, for the force of mortality. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing here. I pick one specific age, age uh, 65. I visualize the observed um, uh, mortality, uh, the observed death rates with, with the dots. And then I'm going to add the, the fitted uh, death rates and their projections uh, forward. So how do you recognize that I make the switch here from the kappas to the, to, the, uh, to the mortality, sorry, to the force of mortality or to the death rates? Well, you have to pay attention here to the specification that you see uh, over here. So I take the exponential, I use the beta 1s plus the beta 2s multiplied with the kappa 2s. So these are for the uh, fitted values. So that's the red line that you see over here. And then for the forecasts, I'm going to do my fan chart and I'm going to do it based on um, these quantities here. And so where you recognize the same transformation, you combine the generation, uh, generated scenarios for the kappas with the calibrated beta ones and beta twos, you take the exponential. So then you are at the level of the force of mortality. Yeah. So that's what you can do here. I do that for age 65. Of course, you can do that for whichever age you would like to use in your visuals. Okay. And then I've got like um, some final graphs uh, for which I didn't include the code, but what we see, oops, it's a bit heavy. Um, what we see over here is that I picked three ages, 65, 75, and 85, right? Uh, 65 is in red. So these uh, have the lowest uh, Qs, mortality rates. Then I've got 75 and I've got 85. Be careful, I'm going to use a logarithmic uh, y-axis here to be able to put um, the three of them on the same graph. And what you see here, the solid lines are the 
uh, fitted values for these cubes over time. And then what I do here with the gray lines is that I plot like, uh, I don't exactly remember the number, but I, I plot like 100 uh, scenarios or something uh, generated for these cues to the future. Yeah. Uh, and then I calculate um, quantiles, let's say the 5% quantile, the 95% quantile, and these are the bands that you see over here. Uh, so these are actually generated scenarios and some fan chart kind of um, behavior uh, constructed for the confidence bands uh, over here. This is my own written uh, code. If I would do this with the fan charts, um, which come with the SIM 2001 function, then you get something similar. And so here I use these fan charts to visualize the scenarios generated for, for the future. Okay. Now I want to make one comment here, and that is that you see that the fan chart in red for 65 is wider then, for example, the fan chart that you get in blue here for an 85-year-old. And that has to do with the fact that Lee Carter is only using one time-dependent variable, so that if you look at the variability of your um, mortality uh, forecasts, then that will be driven by the variability in these kappas, multiplied, if you want, huh, with the B, um, uh, influenced with the value by the value of this beta x2 because you've got this beta x2 and multiplied with the kappa t2 and we find um, a motivation or an explanation for that uh, phenomenon in another paper by Andrew Kearns from 2011 so you find here the link to this paper mortality density forecasts and analysis of six stochastic mortality models so you see that for the Lee Carter model, denoted here with M1, indeed, the H85 fans are narrower than the uh, H65 fans because this Lee Carter model has only a single stochastic period effect. And for M1, the widths of the fans are proportional to the H effect beta x2. And now you may remember from our plots earlier on that the beta for H85 is going to be smaller than the beta that we calibrate for H65. And that explains here why this variability in the blue fan chart is smaller than the one in, in, in the black fan chart. And people often say, OK, this is a, a drawback of Lee Carter. Hmm? Um, this is um, something we, we don't want. And for that reason, we will go for stochastic mortality models where the um, time-dependent um, time dependent, uh, effects are not captured by a single time-dependent parameter, like here, the kappa t, but where you have multiple, um, where you have, uh, multiple of these uh, stochastic period effects, like in a Lee and Lee model, or like in a, a CBD model or a general or a plot model or something like that. And that helps to get rid of this, uh, of this phenomenon. Yeah. So that's a consideration about this uh, single period, uh, uh, single period dependent effect, kappa T2 in the, in the Lee Carter. Okay. That's what I wanted to show with the sheets. So let me just uh, go back to the code once more to illustrate um, the essential steps over here. So we arrived at point uh, 2.5, forecasting with, with time series. So we're going to load the forecast library. We're going to calibrate this random walk with drift. Huh? So you see here that I've got the drift parameter. I've got my uh, variability of the noise terms. I've got my information criteria. And I can easily plot this um, forecasted time series. That's the graph you recognize from the, from the sheets, right? Now to use our, uh, our routines from the live metrics project, we're going to load the simmodels.r script. So I've got the script open here. So you recognize the same layout as uh, for the fit models. You recognize a function sim2001 for the model M1. 
So you see here what um, the specification of this function is. So this is, of course, pretty technical, but the essential steps are like, are like here, right? Where you say, I'm going to calibrate the next value uh, of the kappas from the previous one, plus the drift term, plus uh, a random, uh, a normally distributed uh, noise term that I multiply here, or that we have to multiply with the um, with the standard deviation of the of the normal distribution that you want to have, right? So that is where essentially this generation of scenarios from the random walk with drift is, is taking place. And we can also try to find where the mu2, I didn't check that at home, yeah, but um, here you see uh, how this uh, drift parameter is estimated, and here you also see how the uh, variance of the noise terms is, is being estimated. Uh, and the D2, um, these D2 are the differences of our time series um, estimated for, for kappa 2, right? So these are like, that's the way how you should go through this code. So where are the essential steps? I, I take the one leg time differencing here. I calibrate my diff term. I calibrate my, my variability of my noise terms. I set up this recipe for the random walk with drift. That's the things you need to recognize. That you need to recognize from, from this code, right? So if I implement or if I use this uh, routine, voila, then I can use it to gener generate scenarios uh, for the future. It was a bit too fast. We're still calibrating. So I'm going to do 10,000 scenarios. Um, this is what I get in return. So I can look at the times starting in 2010, going to 2067 look at my dimensions. So these are all uh, the kinds of the kind of things that I explained earlier on, right? Um, so this is my first scenario. This is my best estimate scenario. If I would take, let's say, the, oops, the second scenario, for instance, voila, then what is striking is that it starts again from the same value, right? because that's the uh, most recently uh, observed or the most recent value for my, for my kappa, for my uh, time dependent uh, uh, parameters. Okay. And then you see the code to do the graphs um, further on. So I've got my fan chart. Voila. So that's what you recognize from the sheets. Uh, you can play with that. You can put it in a different color uh, and so on and so forth. Then I've got my simulations for my age um, 65. Of course, then I have to do the, sim the transformation. Huh? So I've got to work with the exponential of the beta 1 plus the beta 2 multiplied with the kappa 2. So that's for the, for the red line over... Um, over here. Um, yeah, that's for the red line over there. And what I'm going to add then are my scenarios generated. So that's what you see over here. Now I'm multiplying with all the scenarios generated for the kappas. And then the bullets that I add, so these are the points in this statement. These are the observed um, rates uh, over time for, in this case, uh, 65 year olds. Yeah. And then here is the plot um, where I create for, in this case, I think 1,000 random scenarios, what's going to happen. So I picked 1,000. You can see that over here. I picked 1,000 scenarios. So that's what's happening. And then I'm going to define the empirical quantiles, which I want to picture. So that's the 5% quantile uh, and the 95% quantile. Then I'll get something like this. Yeah. So this is the plot that we recognize from the lecture sheets. Okay. And apparently the gray lines here are composed of 1,000 scenarios that I picked 
from the generated uh, scenarios. Okay. So then the very last step is to use these uh, fan charts, which are built in uh, or which are available in the sim models uh, routine. Voila. So if I put those together, then I got a good view on what my, according to Lee Carter, huh, what my projection would be for the mortality rates of a 65 year old, a 75 year old and an 85 year old. All right. So that's what I wanted to uh, demonstrate. Um, so once again, it's, this was all for Lee Carter, uh, but the ideas are transferable to any of the other methods that we discussed in the, in the, in the class. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind. 